<coughs> Thank you, Danny. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Innes. I'm director of the Conflict Records Unit. Uh, Conflict Records Unit is part of the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. Um, this is the first of our uh, speaker series. We have about one of these a month that's going on over the course of the next year. Uh, we also have a, a conference. Uh, it will be our first that we'll be uh, holding in May or June of next year. The theme is documenting war and the call for papers was just uh, uh, made public yesterday and today. And I think the link will be dropped into the chat function. The, um, the structure of tonight's, uh, this evening's talk, uh, we'll, we'll spend about 45 minutes um, and that'll include um, some, introduction, uh, some introduction. I'll introduce our guest, Thomas Heckhammer. Um, he has uh, some, some very cool slides and he'll be talking about the Jihadi Document Repository. And then we'll have time for a little bit of uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, if you have any questions for Thomas, just drop them into the chat box. I'll moderate those and then we can uh, discuss from there. So uh, with that, uh, Thomas, thank you for joining us. It's, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to have Thomas joining us. Thomas is a senior research fellow with the Norwegian Defense Research Institute. Um, he is a leading scholar of jihadi movements and has published widely on the subject. Um, the title of tonight's talk is Reflections on the Jihadi Document Repository, which means for reasons that I think will become pretty self-evident, uh, we're going to be talking quite a bit about information and, and technology as a, at least part of, I, I suppose, part of what we'll be talking about. Um, and I think a useful point of entry for that is uh, Thomas's, what I think is your most recent publication, an article in this, uh, the, the current edition of Foreign Affairs. Um, and, and Thomas, why don't you walk us through that? And that'll set the, the context, the backdrop for uh, I think probably the main thrust of uh, of tonight's of tonight's talk. Yeah, sure. So the that article is called um, "Resistance is Futile," uh, because it argues that um, in the West, uh, states have uh, sort of solidly won over um, jihadi groups um like al-qaeda and islamic state uh, and the, the sort of the point the bigger point i'm trying to make is that um under the surface of a seeming sort of constant stream of attacks which you know would suggest that the the, the the jihadi movement has been alive and well under that surface has has occurred a a big and deep shift um uh in favor of states and state power and uh i'm arguing that this this shift has been long in the making and in fact it starts before 9 11 and it's primarily driven by technology um and um so the, the, so the, the the even bigger point here is that technology probably empowers states more than they empower uh, non-state actors, um, and uh, we are, uh, and, and the, 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 the jihadi attacks that we've seen in the 2000s and 2010s are sort of um, quite exceptional in a sense, and, uh, and, and, they, and they don't really, they haven't really undercut that bigger and deeper trend in favor of state state power and i I'm, i see that trend continuing in the future especially with the rise of artificial intelligence and such and i suppose the link here to what we're discussing today is um is about propaganda and the role of propaganda in um um uh, in rebel recruitment and and the sustaining of rebel groups like jihadi groups um uh, and um i think i say at various places in the article that i think propaganda distribution technology has, has been very very important for the the rise of um jihadism uh, over the past few decades uh 
the especially of course with the with the internet and its various its various sort of technical te technical solutions for 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 distribution and um um now of course states have realized this and are currently clamping down very hard on propaganda distribution online um and i think by the way that's one of the important reasons why we're seeing less activity uh today uh but in so before that big clampdown on online propaganda around 2017 um jihadi groups were quite free to disseminate stuff online and that made available a tremendous amount of primary sources and um and um material coming from the groups themselves and this has been a very very important window into these groups uh and and, the, and probably the, the main data source for um myself my own work and my the, that of my colleagues over the years so what we have been doing uh for years is to mine this resource to 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 collect the the propaganda that jihadi groups put online and and um and store it and, and analyze it um and um uh there came a point a, a few years ago where we decided that the, some of this material has public interest uh you know, can be used for research and should be made available but that's sort of the starting point for the story of the jihadi document repository that's that's a really um <clears throat> that's a really great setup i'm just the, the immediate question that comes to mind, and I guess I'll ask it now, but we can park it and come back to it later, is that as you're going to present, I think the Jihadi Document Repository um, has its origins back in the mists of time prior to the advent or the real explosion in, in what you call propaganda distribution technologies. And so there's a question of volume and the doability of, of collecting this kind of material um as individuals as researchers i think that's probably a theme that you're you're going to if i had to guess you're going to visit you know mention that but we'll revisit it later as well yeah that's excellent if you want to if you want to um kick off with your slide presentation i think that's probably a, a good a good setup for that yeah sure um so uh, is that visible to everyone it is okay yeah so um i suppose uh a characteristic of this particular collection of documents is that it's not really conflict documents these are not captured in the field but they're mostly um uh collected uh, online from a safe distance <laughs> um and so they're also voluntarily published uh, by the, the groups in question, as opposed to uh, kind of uh, unwillingly relinquished <laughs> under conquest. <laughs> so there's a dimension there, I suppose, that sets this apart from from perhaps some of the other collection that you'll be discussing um, in the months ahead. Um, the um, oh, sorry. Uh, so basically I'm, i'll talk a little bit about the background give an overview of the repository um reflect on some lessons and mention some future plans and the the repository is at jdr.as if anybody would like to browse it as we as we uh, as we speak um although it does require registration um but you can get a little bit into the a certain depth into the database without um, registration. So the the background, as I mentioned earlier, is is that we have been collecting jihadi propaganda for a long time, and uh, we're sitting on a very large collection. Um, the terrorism research group here at FFI was founded in 1999, and I arrived in 2001. Uh, by which time my uh, colleague and boss then Brynja Leah was already um, uh, collecting things he already had uh, you know, was very well familiar with azam.com this uh, old 
jihadi website. Um, and um, uh, after 9-11, of course, with the general kind of interest in this topic, uh, we, um, we beefed up this effort and have, have been basically at it ever since. Um, and this, and of course, with the, the the advent of sort of you know internet-based propaganda distribution and this the enormous scale that this took, it produced a very large amount of material. Um, uh, and <clears throat> so we're sitting on. I don't, actually don't know how much <laughs> how much material we we have, um, but it's, I can say that it's sort of mostly from from the web, although. You know, a couple of magazines are, are basically photocopied from libraries in Saudi Arabia and such, uh, but the vast majority is from the, is from from jihadi websites, uh, and it contains all the various uh, forms or, 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 or product types that jihadi propaganda has taken over the years. So magazines, books, declarations, pamphlets, videos, images audio recordings, um, music of the sort of Anashid. Uh, for, uh, we, have, we have copies of entire forums, uh, copies of static web, web pages, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, it's, uh, this collection w was, you know, um, when we started this work with the JDR in around 2014, Fourteen, it was uh, at best semi-organized. Uh, um, basically, it was sitting on hard the hard drives of the individual members of our team, um, and we had made some effort to organize and pool our resources. We have a sort of a shared drive where there was some material, um, but we, we'd never really figured out a way to systematize this collection effort. There, there was just so much, there was such a flow of material coming all the time that we had enough just keeping up with it. And, and, uh, and, and also, and then I'll come back to some of the, a lot of this material is quite unwieldy. Um, it's hard to find a good organizing principle for everything, and maybe there is one, but we 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 didn't um, kind of take the time to sort of sit down and, de and develop a, a really structured way of doing it. So, um, uh, so it so, so we had this sort of big collection, uh, and it was semi semi organized, and we figured this is a a shame because there's no way that we alone will be able to um, utilize it at all. And of course, we and then we had other you know, kind of motivations for doing this too. We we are um, uh, you know we work as academics uh, and and are committed to open science, to 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 sharing data, to making our research replicable. Um, and um, and we are of the view that too many professors die uh, with un unshared material on their shelves. Um, sharing is the future, <laughs> of, and, and 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 vital to 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 scientific progress. And uh, and so we f we felt that we needed to do. Our share to, to you know for for the cause the cause of open open science here. Um, another motivation was that a lot of this material is transient, so it's it stays up for a while and then it's gone. Um, a general problem, I suppose, with internet material, but all the more so in this field that you know is has you know undergone kind of has been a sort of um, under pressure from authorities. Uh, and, you know, various times, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, websites and such will be closed down, uh, and the material might be gone forever. So <clears throat> there was uh, a uh, we saw it, you know a need here for, to, to basically preserve for posterity some of this um, sort of material. Material, and the final motivation was that we saw a, a gap in the market, as it were, the market of um, repositories or, or, or data collection efforts for early material, especially specifically pre-2010. Um, 
10 material. And um, many of you will be familiar, broadly familiar with the landscape of um, propaganda collections and repositories. You, you, you have uh, things like uh, you know, the Open Source Center, or formerly FBIS in, in the US, which it covers, um, it goes quite far back, um, um, but is, 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 uh, is closed off to the public. Uh, for a while, it was open to kind of um, academics and, and others, but at, at some point 10 years ago or so, they, they made it US government employee only. Uh, so even, so, so we couldn't even access it. Um, and you've had some, you have some commercial actors like uh, Rita Katz's site uh, intelligence um, group, which started in the early 2000s. They have a lot of material, but it's subscription based and it's not cheap. Uh, same, same with uh, BBC monitoring, uh, relatively old, have a, tons of material, but uh, but uh, uh, subscription based. Same with memory. Memory is uh, um, sort of um, propaganda uh, collection outfit. Uh, they started, I think, a little bit later, um, but again, subscription based. So, really, the only major repository for um, this type of material has been Aaron Zellin's Jihadology. Um, and uh, which is obviously a phenomenal effort and a, a, a very, very valuable uh, undertaking. Uh, uh, however, he started around 2010 and has been naturally you know, busy um, covering new material and, and filling it in with the new material that comes in. Uh, so, it, so that collection kind of starts around 2010. It doesn't have earlier material. Um, so, and then of course you you have some special collections which has material from the two thousands and and such and earlier. Uh, you have the Harmony documents, of course, at West Point. You have um, an, another uh, project at uh, Haverford or Haverford College, and more recently you have things like uh, Emma Tamimi's Islamic State uh, archives. But these are what we might call kind of special collections. You know, the, the cover a particular subset of um, of the propaganda uh, production, jihad propaganda production. <clears throat> and in some cases, of course, in, in the Harmony case, uh, not just propaganda, but you know, internal, confiscated internal documents. Um, so we figured we would try and make something slightly different, basically a, a, a repository for texts of reference by uh, jihadi groups um, going back in time um, and focusing on magazines and major texts uh, uh, and um, because they're more they're, they're more wieldy um, uh, we decided to only include texts um, um, and to and to focus on pre two thousand and ten material and to try and sort of aim for kind of backward completeness rather than forward completeness um, uh, and sort of basically leave the job of getting the latest to others uh, and, and to focus on getting perhaps more rare historical uh, material and put it put it in our in our repository. Another aim was to have this public and free um, and to have it uh, there for a long time to, to make it um, as, as prominent as things can be in the, on the internet. Um, um, there were multiple challenges. Um, we hadn't done this before and uh, so um, and, we, and we struggled with things like um, the state of the collection I mentioned earlier, the just the um, the, the fact that it wasn't uh, properly organized, and there was a lot of it, and it has it contained formats that um, are uh, can be unwieldy, like videos, for example, or uh, and, and 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 such, you know, which quickly 
at least when we started this in the in mid 2010s um was slightly challenging from a from a technical point of view um um things like um privacy concerns and copyright and such now copyright is i think was less of a concern because um this was from websites that were published by you know run run and published by jihadi groups so in i mean i'm not a lawyer uh but i think it does make a difference if you know, these actors have volunteered the material in the public sphere as opposed to having them taken from them um also the privacy issue or kind of the, uh, there's a you know there's potentially a an element of um, concern here in that these, some of these magazines might mention the names of people who uh, maybe later they defect or something, and they and, and they you know rather not be associated with the the movement, or maybe those maybe these magazines mention uh, kind of third parties in some way and are therefore kind of identified in this collection by by us, but we um considered you know we judged the the the, the nature of the the the, the content to be uh, mostly kind of ideological and to contain relatively little um information like li like that i think th that that issue becomes much more acute when you're when you're dealing with internal documents captured in the field um more worrying perhaps was the issue of kind of misuse the, the the possibility that if we put this online jihadis might use our platform <laughs> to as a source for their own propaganda i mean if their website went down they could come to us to find a backup um and finally of course the, the, just the technical side of it now how, how how exactly how do you go about building uh, a, a a website for for this you know, of this kind um so we ended up with basically uh, sort of, sort of setting up a little sort of, little sort of project uh, or task force on this uh, with some, uh, we, we were lucky to get funding from uh, sort of from FFI uh, around 50,000 um, pounds, which are allowed us to hire um, a, a part-time research assistant. Um, and I should mention here uh, that uh you know it, it is this research assistant his name is eric scara uh, who's now you know full, fully fledged phd and a great one at that he did the vast majority of the um uh, the work the practical work for, for for this and for getting it up and running um he made the, the document repository effectively um and so 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 we basically um um yeah, started on this project, and we decided to sort of keep it limited in scope. Start small, and then perhaps you know, build add material later, rather than trying to have something really complete to begin with. Um, we decided to host this on the University of Oslo's website. Um, this was a kind of a natural port of call because Brynjar, um, uh, Lia. Uh, uh has an affiliation there um we prefer to have it on an academic site partly for kind of longevity and partly for uh just the um, per, you know the perception of the collection uh to to we did we did we really genuinely wanted want this to be you know a contribution to you know the I, to, to the, the academic study of, of of this, as opposed to you know some government effort. So um, we 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 thought figured that you know, you know the University of Oslo would be a more, kind of a more neutral uh, platform um, to to protect against misuse. We made it registration based, um, which uh, of course is a you know, it's a trade-off. Uh, it does, I think, really limit the um, usage uh, of the, the site. Um, but I, I don't think we could have risked in doing it otherwise. And we watermarked all the documents. Um, we launched this in, in late 2016. 
it took probably a little over a year, I think, from we from when we started this to, to, to until it was published. Let me quickly just you know give you a guided tour of, of this. So on the left is what you see when you go to jdr.as. You'll see it's kind of organized in so in 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 kind of four main um, categories. You have journals, you have writings by ideologues and, and leaders, and you have bio biographies and memoirs by um, uh, members of, of these groups. Um, and the, the 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 fourth one is a it's not really as it cuts it cuts into the other three, but it's material in in, in English. And then, so let's say you click on the journals link, you get to another where it's sorted into languages, um, uh, Arabic, English, and Urdu. Um, you click on say the Arabic one, and you get to another sort of filter uh, organized by organized geogra geographically. Um, and th this is these these uh, filters are mainly to keep it manageable because the number of of magazines magazine titles is in the several tens, so it's probably around fifty. Um, and cl clicking on say Central Asia and, Co and the Caucasus, you get to the page on the right here with various magazine titles. Um, going back to the mid nineteen eighties, with the, the the first. You know, jihadi magazine being uh, Al Jihad magazine, which you see there down on the left. Uh, click on Al Jihad, and you get to sort of a magazine presentation page with a little vignette and links to PDFs of all the uh, issues that we have. It's uh, in this particular case we have a near complete collection. I think we're missing about ten, ten issues of uh, of over a hundred. I think uh, one hundred and fifteen or twenty. 1984 to 1995, I think. Um, and click on one of those links and you get a PDF in your browser window. Um, go back, uh, uh, click on the sort of the ideologues and leaders, you'll get again to a kind of a geography selector and go deeper in, you'll get to individual names. Um, and you can look up, say, uh, Abdul Qadir bin Abdul Aziz, uh, Dr. Dr. Fadl, um, and you get a brief biography and a, a you know, a, and links to the some of the the, the main main works of, of his. Um, for most of these individuals, we don't have complete. We don't, we haven't posted complete collections. Um, um, uh, only the, the 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 main ones. That's, Mainly for for man manageability. Um, um, although I think there's an ambition of, for over you know, to to fill in with more material uh, in the future. Um, similarly, with biographies and memoirs, you can go in there and choose between kind of leader biographies, or foot soldier biographies, or or or, or memoirs. So yeah, also first person accounts, uh, um, and you can. Click on the leader tab, and you get to or link, link, and you get you can look at someone like Yusuf Al Wairi, the um, leader of Al Qaeda in Saudi Arabia in two thousand and three, um, and you'll you'll find links to kind of biographies about him from the jihadi literature. Um, so that's the, that's basically. Um, it. It's very relatively simple, uh, a simple structure, um, and um, it's not a very large repository. Uh, I think, in, you know, compared to others you find in the in the world in the world of libraries and document collections. Um, um, but it is unique in the sense that it it has um, much, especially on the magazine side, has much of the material that has been published by this movement over the years and um and you won't find it anywhere else um, you'll find individual titles or you know sub collections somewhere elsewhere but not 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 a uh, not 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 a, a broad selection like you have here um there's obviously a lot that we don't have um 
so uh, for example, you have, you know, there's a ton of texts that don't kind of fit the mag neither the magazine or the book format. There might be kind of, you know, little pamphlets or state one page statements, two page statements, uh, uh, photo montages that are somewhere between kind of images and statements. I mean, it's, it's just like a whole gray area of formats here that of, you know, with, with you know, literally, th you know, tens of thousands of items that uh, we haven't, we, we haven't, we haven't included. Uh, we've chosen to include other major titles where we have relatively complete uh, collections. So, um, what have we observed in terms of impact? Um, uh, we see we, we, we've, we, we see that it's been used by academics and by students and journalists. Um, we have seen um, some citations in academic publications, uh, not a tremendous amount, you know, 38 hits on Google Scholar and I think it's five or six books, um, uh, although two of the books are by members of my team. <laughs> um, um, the, I have a suspicion that there, there may be a few more examples of JDR use in the student world, in, you know, student theses and such, um, but um, it's, diff it's more difficult to get a complete uh, overview of that. Um, and we've seen it occasionally used on uh, on, on you know in other other contexts social media and in regular media um uh, we've also been uh, lucky to to kind of get contributions from other members of the scholarly community people who kind of reach out to us and say look i've looked at your collection you're missing these and these issues i happen to have them you know I, uh, i'll be Indeed. happy to share yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so um so that's been a, a very welcome uh uh development that, we, that we're, we're very grateful for um and the fifth is kind of less sort of measurable but I, I do think that this and other uh, repositories contribute to improving replicability uh in our field um for a long time the, the, the quantitative social sciences have been much better at um making their studies replicable uh, the, the quals among us are, you know, have had a tendency to cite stuff and kind of not make it available on the grounds of either, you know, um, you know, you know the material being sent too sensitive or there not being a kind of a platform or a way to to make it make it available. But nowadays, with you know digital tech, it, there's kind of no excuse for for not making it available. So, <clears throat> uh, so so we're I think we're this sort of thing and the stuff sort of thing that you, Michael, have been doing are I think important um, contributions to 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 that. Um, some lessons. Um, it was a lot more work than we anticipated. Um, and the end cost was probably closer to a hundred thousand uh, pounds. And that may even be in the low side because we haven't really then factored in all the hours that those of us kind of, you know, uh, not formally involved in the project have put in, um, which is not a small number. Um, and yeah, so the lesson there, I suppose, is just that it's not just, a, you know, it's not just, you can't just put stuff online. You can't just, just create a repository. That doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It's really, uh, there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that pop up that take time. And one thing we experienced was that a major bottleneck, uh, was, Kind of communication with the people building the platform, so the the web developer team. Uh, um, uh, who are obviously who are obviously not you know specialists in this domain, um, and 
um, and 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 also had you know many many other things to do other than you know, serve serve us. But <clears throat> we that has been a I think a, a, a challenge, and I, I think it, it kind of reflects a, a trade off that many repository builders will face, which is trade off between um, kind of uh, technical quality and flexibility. So by quality, I mean, like, if you want a, a repository on a really solid platform, you know, to the, you know, the today's standards, uh, uh, and you want something that's on in a kind of a high profile, relatively high profile site, like, uh, you know, the, the University of Oslo is a big university, you know, if, 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 you know, <clears throat> it's if you, if you go, if you want to have it there, you you will of course have to deal with the professionals who whose whose responsibility is to is to keep the UIO.no website good. Of course, it'd be easier, but have more flexibility. Things will move faster if we ourselves could set up the website, and but that then you would trade away the quality. Um, but there is a an inherent problem problem there also factoring that you know labor in the it field is even more expensive <laughs> and so you can't just sort of you know just ask uh, you know call up your it guy and say well, i'd like you to do this it's just a couple of days work you know it doesn't work like that you may have to wait two months um and pay for it so it's um that that, that, that is a uh, something to bear in mind. <clears throat> um, the third uh, observation is that um, it hasn't been used very much. Just, um, we are quite honest about that. Uh, we have a little over 200 active subscribers. Um, so demand is relatively small, um, which I think reflects the general uh, kind of focus in our field. The people are focused on the latest developments uh, more than they are focused on the history. Um, so, um, um, and also academia is, <laughs> is small, um, in general. Um, so, uh, but I think, you know, we shouldn't measure, um, uh, success, uh, certainly not primarily in the, in, 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 in this, because I think, um, the academic work that some of these 220 produced may be of a very, very high value. Um, a fourth observation is that uh, we, we haven't observed any kind of attempts to kind of infiltrate or misuse the, the platform, leading me to, to think that maybe that fear has been a little bit uh, exaggerated. Um, some limitations in the current platform that were some other things that we're not entirely satisfied with. Um, first of all, of course, it's not a complete corpus. I mentioned some of the things that are not there. Um, um, also, there's no within document search. Um, so if you type in you know, Saudi Arabia in, uh, in Arabic in the search pane, you'll get nothing, which is unrealistic. I mean, there, there, there's bound to be documents in there mentioning referencing Saudi Arabia. Um, and it has to do with the fact that many of the documents are not OCR. I mean, they, they haven't been uh, processed with optical character recognition, so you can't. So you, and you can tell by trying to copy to mark an area of the text and, and copy and paste it in, into another document. It doesn't work because it's an image, and so, um, so a lot of the PDFs are images, um, and um, um, that is a problem and it's a problem it's a phenomenon you see in many i think many repositories and digital archives um will be we you know and i'll, I'll come back to why that is important uh, but let me say just now for now that the fourth um a fourth kind of frustration is that i think the access uh, mechanism could be a bit more user friendly um uh, and um at, at this point, you can. You know, it can sometimes be difficult to get the registration to work. Um, also, you know, you're if you're not, you know, if you don't 
there's not a, a kind of an entry a central entry point at the beginning you don't you might and so if you go to the site you click you can click your way quite deeply into the web into the site but it's only when you try and access the pdf that the system will tell you that you're not registered so you get and get the illusion that you have access but in fact you don't um some future plans um we we hope to revamp and um expand this in, in, a, in a number of ways we want to expand the collection in, and uh this is probably not that far away we we have already kind of prepared a batch of candidate editions magazine editions in particular um and um i should mention also that some years ago we we built a video archive uh it's probably you know our best early effort at sort of organizing things we actually have a fairly systematic database of videos from the early 2000s to the late 2000s something and we hope to perhaps put that on online as well um but the main thing is is we're going to be working on is to make uh, to extract the text from the images to OCR uh, PDFs and have plain text versions of the documents on the website. Um, not only to allow searches, but also to allow more computational text analysis to be done on these uh, on these documents. Um, there's a huge potential for um, Program the use the use of programmatic methods on jihadi text and has barely been been used in our field. Uh, uh, but to do that, you need a plain text version of of the, of the of the text. And until recently, the big barrier there has been OCR technology. Is it that that it's just been very difficult to get reliable OCR on Arabic? especially on noisy documents but uh, there's been progress there in in recent years and um we um uh, we think it's possible um in the you know coming coming years to to get um sort of ground truth uh quality uh text extraction um from these documents this is at the end i just want to uh, mention <laughs> Assist the sister uh, project of uh, of the JDR, which is the Taliban Sources Repository, which um, Michael knows even better than than me, I suppose. <laughs> um, that's a story, perhaps for another day. But it's um, it it's a sibling in the sense that um, um, it sits on the University of Oslo website on a similar type of similar type of of, of platform um, and, uh, and and has um, related material this time from the Taliban as opposed to from AQ type groups. Um, uh, it is probably you know it's probably a, it's also an extremely valuable extremely valuable collection for for reasons that I think we'll perhaps get back to another time. I think I'll end there, Michael, and then we can. Um, so it was a nice, nice bit of punctuation at the very end with the uh, the TSP. TSP is uh, amongst the few of us who've worked on it is short for the Taliban Sources uh, uh, Project, uh, which has been wisely, you know, uh, now in its current form uh, as as part of or alongside the, the the JDR, the Taliban Sources Repository. I, I managed the Taliban Sources Project, but I was by no means its originator or its um, or its architect, that credit goes to some leading scholars of Afghanistan, award-winning scholars of Afghanistan, Alex Strick, Felix Kuhn, and to a lesser extent, Anand Gopal, who, who joined um, Alex and Felix. And then um, we, we sort of all came together and, and converted in much the same way um, as Thomas, you and your colleagues, you recognized you'd been amassing this stuff as individual researchers. So they had been doing the same thing while living uh, in Kandahar between 2006 and 2011, they would just amassed, you know, all of this material that they'd acquired in the local environment and, and uh, were quite reluctant to let it go at the end of that period and how to make, make it accessible. Uh, that, that is the, the major challenge that, 
that, that projects like the, the JDR, the, the TSP, other projects like it that they face and making it accessible, whether that means taking material that's in siloed individual sort of storage areas or, or drives or personal drives and putting it into a collective space so it can be accessed or indeed uh, using the right kind of technology so that information can be extracted from it or translating it for non-native language speakers of Arabic or Pashto or Dari or what, what have you. Um, there are all manner of, of approaches to encouraging access and enabling wider access to this material. That's why I've always been really fascinated with, with the, the JDR, watching it sort of mature. And in fact, you know, uh, when we were completing the Taliban sources project, which you know, in terms of numbers, it was about 50,000 pages of scanned material. Uh, mostly in Pashto, a little bit of Dari and a trench of Arabic as well, uh, translated, uh, including some translations, about 2 million words worth or more of trans translated to English. Um, there was nowhere to put it. You know, we, we wanted to do this and then we, we had the same vision in mind. We were sort of running parallel tracks. We wanted to make sure that this was placed in a stable institutional repository, which would enable broad um, it's a responsible access is probably the best way to put it. Scholarly access, uh, not not uncontrollable access or, or or uncontrolled access, but mind you, the 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 project originators sort of had in mind something like um, shoveling it all onto Google uh, so that it could really be universally accessible. I think we sort of curtailed that a little bit and and, and shaped that a little bit. Um, but that's certainly informed projects like. Um, you know, the conflict records unit. Um, you know, I've looked at, at how you have done things with the, the Jihadi document repository. I've looked at a lot of other examples of, you know, efforts to make this kind of material available, accessible, to do it in a way that encourages scholarship rather than discourages it. Um, and that, and that you know, contributes to the wider body of, body of knowledge, open science, as, as you were discussing. I've got a ton of questions for you. I think this is, this is really fascinating stuff, and it's always really captured my attention. Um, we've got one or two two questions in the chat already. Um, I just want to tell uh, attendees, um, if you have any questions, just drop them into the um, chat box and, and I can uh, verbalize them. I, Thomas, I don't know if you can see them. Um, there is one question from uh, Michael S. Smith II. Uh, how can data collectors contribute? Which is, of course, a great question to be asked. Uh, I get a lot of requests for access to data from my archives. It'd be easier to shovel, for example, all of the AMAC reports to a site like yours than to try to share on a per request basis. Indeed, um, you made the point, Thomas, that you know too many professors die with you know their private papers just not not ever being put anywhere. Um, and so, so creating uh, something like the Jihadi document repository is, is a great space, uh, but it, it comes obviously with, with a burden of cost and, and management. And it's, it's actually quite a bit more challenging to set up a stable, credible sort of repository. We started building one for the conflict records unit purely for storage. We haven't yet, you know, it's quite a, quite a ways off before we can get to the point where we're talking about uh, a, a public facing, you know, portal where people can access and view material, because that's a whole another layer of cost. Uh, so we've created a conflict records repository purely for storage for individual scholars within the King's College uh, community to be able to park these repositories or for people working, especially in our case, we're, we're very interested in really contentious materials, right? There's, there's contention that is attached to uh, primary sources being generated by parties to conflict while that conflict is going on. Right? Access can be contentious, the contents can be contentious. And so if you're a researcher gaining access to this and in possession of this, that can create jeopardy of all kinds, depending on what your local context is, what the laws governing access to the kind of material is. And so our view is confront this head on and create a space where this is doable. I don't know if that, if that matches your view. I think the practical question for Michael is, how can contributors contribute? And I, I guess my first guess would be to get in touch with you. Um, to get in touch with us as well. Uh, but if it's more specialized stuff, definitely get in touch with Thomas. Thomas, do you wanna, do you wanna address that? Um, no, that's, that's basically it. We don't have a kind of a 
formal mechanism or an upload uh, page or anything like that. Um, and they, they would, you know, we'd have to, and we, we can't promise speed either, um, uh, especially now that we're in a process, in the process of, of kind of reorganizing the, the site. But we are very interested in contributions like, like that, especially if, if, if the, it's a sort of near complete uh, collection uh, that, that kind of that forms a unit. Um, so I'm very grateful for Michael's uh, offer. Um, and uh, be happy to talk talk more about it. Hey, let me say also that generally the problem in this domain is funding, uh, because um, this type of work is, as I mentioned, it's quite labor intensive and it requires maintenance. And as everybody in academia knows, it's really hard to get money for maintenance. You know, funders want novelty and of they, often they want you know they want analysis they want answers to questions um, they don't just want documentation uh, like this and so it's quite hard to get um, institutions funders to see the value of efforts like like, like this I mean most people say not and say yeah this is really cool this is kind of useful but when push comes to shove when you know, they have to take their wallets out. It, it often <laughs> changes. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, it, the situation changes. So, um, in another, I guess, uh, observation from where I can hear, whether I probably should have put in the plus slides, it's just, it's just, just that. Um, uh, this is technically challenging, and um, I've. Um, Kind of come to discover uh, just how technically challenging it is and why we have library science, uh, why we have dedicated you know, specialists uh, work on, 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 on this. And, um, and, and um, uh, I have the highest respect for that type of work. And I think um, um, perhaps uh, we hadn't, haven't been good enough at sort of learning from them and getting involved with with them and and, and so on. So, so I think going forward, we'll try to to kind of uh, leverage that more. Um, although again, it, it is difficult because you often kind of you run into kind of institutional bureaucratic barriers and time constraints and so on and so forth. But um, the bottom line is that if you're a kind of a regular academic you know working on sort of substantive issues don't think that you can, that you can just build a website i mean you you, you are going to need the help of specialists yeah. those, those are really solid points i've got i've got two questions that i think flow from that um one one is uh i'll put them both out there one is um you mentioned uh who's working on or who's accessing this well, I, I think when I, when I look at this, when I look at what you've collected, I see so many opportunities for research projects. Um, of course, you know, being, you know, we're, we're part of the academic community. So I'm thinking in terms of academic projects, master's projects, PhD uh, projects, or what have you. Uh, you know, are, are PhD students, do you have students actively using this as kind of the, uh, either the core or adjunct to their, their research? Um, I guess I'll ask that question first, and then I've got a second question about, uh, one kind of project that really comes to mind when I when I look at some of the challenges that you mentioned. Yeah, so well, well, what I can say is that just anecdotally from the requests, I can tell that there are students who seem to want to use this in their theses um, because we when people register, they're encouraged to briefly describe who they are and what they're going to use it for, and, uh, and they're required to have a an institutional email uh, and so i can tell just for anecdotally from from that from those sorts of requests that you know, at least people students are considering this but i we haven't been um i guess very good at keeping in touch with our users um and kind of following up and asking you know, what you know what did did, what did what did you end up using this and what for and and so on um i guess we're not very um we haven't been very 
uh, PR uh, kind of uh, <laughs> conscious. Uh, we haven't done nearly perhaps as much as we should have to kind of do to sort of um, yeah to to to, to kind of. Uh, showcase uh, the you know, applications because you know we could have maybe we should um, stay in touch one more with users have them briefly describe the use cases and and then present those use cases uh, as inspiration for others and something like that but that just hasn't been um, it's not something that we've we've done until now sounds sounds like it could be the basis for a research network actually maybe absolutely. Something. Maybe 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 a, a point that we can discuss offline at some point. Maybe yeah, it's something that we've we've discussed as well. Um, yeah, let's let's definitely <laughs> great. Uh, let's let's pick that one up uh, later. My second question: um, You mentioned library science, and that that resonates quite strongly, of course. Um, and, and and one of the things that we've been looking at is is the increasing attention to archival approach. Not not just with the work that hist historians do and that history does, but proper archival work, proper library science work, and not just in the sense of what high technology enables of that now, uh, but but you know the fundamentals of library science and archival science, which of course emerged out of the you know the beginnings of of open source intelligence work, um, uh, you know in the Second World War and the Cold War and after that, and it's got its origins. You know, there's a great deep. Uh, backstory to this, and 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 um, I, I guess to to bring that around to my question, when when looking at the challenges that you identified uh, and the state of the collection, um, I, I'm just wondering if you know. I mean, you can sort of see that one of the projects that you could orient around the jihadi document repository is improvements to the jihadi document repository. You've got a collection of more or less raw documents that have got a little bit of organization, but need a lot more work. That in itself is a research project. If you were to sign you know, a slew or, or a full run of a magazine or two, and somebody has to assign the metadata to this uh, to help improve, you know, that, that could be the kind of project um, that that could usefully be structured, but I guess the hmm. the, the question pra practically is when you're looking at um, scans of, of Arabic language or non non Latin script, for example, that's more or where where OCR technology and other kinds of scanning and reading technologies haven't caught up or haven't yet developed. You know the obvious the obvious things to do with that if you've got the time and the money and and uh, and the will is transcription and trans uh, transliteration and translation. Um, but before that, I mean, I'm just wondering about the metadata on each one of those images, for example, is there any, is there an, a part of the, what you did as individual scholars before that material went in there to basically create, you know, a card catalog for each one of those items? Is there some descriptive data about each file? Um, the kind of thing that will improve the functioning of, of a repository like this in the way that you know archivists and, and librarians indeed would would take this material and, and make it usable yeah so the, <clears throat> uh, the answer is no i mean there's, there's no underlying kind of sql database or anything like that it's just links on pages um so uh, but it's i mean it, the, it's probably would be relatively straightforward to create to extract metadata you can i mean if you have a, access credentials nothing stops you actually from scraping the whole thing and um and um you can extract metadata from the file names so they're they're the meaningful they're meaningfully named most of most of the time um but there isn't an underlying infrastructure uh, you know that is sort of lends itself directly to um yeah, to, to to sort of more automated uh, processes, and that's one of the things that we we want to address. When I say we want to make it more kind of programming friendly, that's one of the one of the, the things um, I have in mind. Uh, so, um, um, the um, and I think it's obviously necessary as as the as the, as the collection grows. Yeah, indeed. I, I, I want to ask you a question about, so you made some practical choices to make this a more workable project over the long term, and that's choosing certain kinds of material to include and to, and to focus on that, primarily on text. And I'm just, I, I guess I'm wondering about 
I mean, that's that's a good practical choice. It, it, it focuses on what's achievable and what's doable and what's sustainable. But I'm wondering uh, what, uh, what, what sort of pain you might feel in terms of acknowledging all the other material that you're not including in there. And, and uh, um, I, I guess by extension, the question is, what do you make of this new landscape? There's not just, not just this you know, extraordinary volume of material that's being produced across all kinds of formats, but the, increasingly the, te the technology has now begun to develop. Indeed, as you point out in your foreign affairs article, to actually be able to manage that and to make sense of it and to extract meaning. So I'm just wondering what you make of that landscape, a, a, a particular from the viewpoint of somebody who's a trained scholar and historian, where you can make those pragmatic choices about the kinds of sources that you're going to privilege because you can work on them. Yeah, so um, the big thing that happened in this you know, in the past 20 years in this domain is that we went at some point we went from a situation of data scarcity to data access um, and so in the era of data scarcity by which i mean uh, a time when there was little information to be uh, found about terrorist groups you had to re re kind of piece together a picture from really fragmented evidence and uh, you know if you're lucky they had a maybe an early website and you could you know analyze that and 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 so i think but incidentally that's why a lot of kind of uh, prominent uh, scholars in the field until recently have been historians um people who you know who, who are good at working with scarce evidence or you know, with kind of this type of material um but um later on uh, perhaps for to some extent, arguably either in a, in the middle of the iraq war or certainly in in 10 years later in 2013 14 uh, we went from went to, to a situation where the amount of data just became completely unmanageable, completely. Um, and um, um, we noticed because up until around 2013, we were kind of able. We had a, we had a sense that we were kind of we had a sense of a bit of overview. We knew kind of where the where the main platforms were we had a sense of the kind of the, the main publications coming out of you know aq type groups uh, in a given month uh, we had we didn't have a kind of a strong sense that uh, we're, we're missing a lot um, but that changed with social media and, and and the proliferation of new platforms and i guess the point i'm trying to make is that um um there is now data overflow and so maybe different skill sets are needed uh, and i think if you're planning to work in this domain in the future you probably want to consider looking into programming and computational methods um, to um, to handle all of this uh, so in some sense the the field is becoming kind of more similar to other kind of social phenomena you know if you want to study some other social phenomena where data is abundant you 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 have to have a you know a sense of uh, you know, how what what to make of the the the, the amount the sheer amount of, the, of data, and um, I'm not saying that everyone should be doing that, but at least until now the field of jihadi studies has been um, virtually uh, empty of that type of work, and um, and I think there's a big potential there for for exploiting this the, these data. Um, so, as you say, I mean, the, the, with these, with, with this amount of data, in the use of um, in the internet for propaganda distribution, come opportunities. And uh, in, so, for example, nowadays, some of the main platforms for IS and AQ propaganda are on platforms that have API, so, so application programming interfaces, which makes collection super easy um uh, you can basically have a uh, you know a script that just runs in the background and and and, and lifts uh, every single every bit and piece from that website automatically for you in the past you'd, you'd have to either 
you know, do it manually or program a fairly sophisticated, say, Selenium uh, script to 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 to, to, to simulate a human um, collector. So <clears throat> uh, there are opportun a lot of opportunities here as well. Yeah, and of course, this this is almost all. You know, what, what we're talking about is the world of online uh, information and, and and you know digital digital information. I mean, there there remains an entire other world that that is entirely analog, that is entirely paper based. Um, that that I mean that that was the basis for the Taliban Sources project, where we had to begin with paper material and how do we make it accessible to a broader community? Of course, we have to convert it, scan it, digitize it make it available online. So there is still room for the traditional historian who's, you know, the gumshoe looking for paper and looking for, you know, lost archives or, or hidden archives or archives or what have you. Um, last question, I think, um, you know, advice, advice to students or researchers or investigators of any kind, really, who are working alone, working as individuals, um, as opposed to somebody working within an institutional context who can leverage the IT section to build them a repository or um, you know, come with, with other kinds of institutional resources that allow them access that might not be doable for individuals. I'm thinking of you know, the master's student, the PhD student who's starting to you know, acquire materials and build up their own collections. Any kind of advice? With, with regard to how to handle the material, you mean? Yeah, if they're thinking about something, they're, they're, they've got a particular interest in a publication or an organization, and they want to start, you know, developing their own collection for reference and and, and scholarly, scholarly. I mean, for research purposes, for for purposes of acquiring the material for analytical purposes. Um. Um. I, I suppose. The same principle. I mean, I don't have a, something revelatory to to suggest, but but I guess um, get try to try to get an overview of what already exists out there, uh, so not so that you don't replicate or, or do the same work twice over, and, and that would also help you identify gaps in the existing collections, in places where perhaps you might contribute. Um, um, and there, of course, there are tons of other considerations nowadays. So, so collecting data on jihadi websites today is a different ball game from five or ten years ago because there's just a lot more surveillance. A lot, it's a lot harder to get. You get kicked out of sites by the site owners much more easily. Um, much harder to um, to navigate. Um, and you're probably more likely to kind of get sort of on um, authorities' radar if you do this. Now, that's generally not a problem, um, uh, although um, some countries have become quite heavy-handed. Um, now, and not just towards Muslim students, who I think have always uh, been more at risk of kind of, uh, you know, un justify kind of police interest um, because they've been sort of people, people the police is sort of you know, suspected that they are uh, sympathizers rather than, than scholars that has happened on a number of occasions but even like even um, non-muslim bona fide researchers I know of several instances now where people have run into problems and it's Particularly, let me say this, and <laughs> this is public, I'll happy to say that it's particularly in the UK this has happened. Um, you know, people having their, basically their laptops and their mobile phones confiscated for months by British authorities um, because uh, of the type of the material that they've collected on jihadi websites. So um, it's... Um, an area to be approached with some caution uh, th th these days and, and and so if you do it do it kind of i would say do it openly make sure that you're signaling your kind of um, kind of academic um, objectives and credentials etc clearly so that there's no confusion or, or room for 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 mistakes because that can cause problems you raise an interesting point, and I think it, it's uh, 
an interesting detail, uh, which, which uh, you know, when we talk about the Taliban Sources Project or repository, and one of the reasons why it's now on, you know, University of Oslo servers and not somewhere else is precisely because of the kind of, I guess, lack of understanding about why these kind of repositories are created, these collections are created and the potential uses for research and how legal atmospherics can create jeopardy for researchers, regardless of how credible or institutionally based or whatever. And indeed, transparency and, and, and openness about why you're doing the research. As an academic, that may not satisfy others, journalists or other kinds of researchers, but for academics, it's certainly a good start point. A, co a, a connecting observation, I think, from, from a member of the audience, I, I guess I'm gonna paraphrase paraphrase slightly is do you think do you think researchers need to have a certain degree of civic mindedness um, when they're doing this kind of research do you think there's any kind of default forensic setting given that some of the material they may be looking at particularly if it's in near real time or connected to ongoing conflict may have you know implications for for potential prosecutions not just for terrorism but for other kinds of criminal acts uh, do you think there's a uh, a need to deconflict, to use an intelligence term, uh, with, I'll, I'll read the question here, uh, with governments when conducting research targeting jihad as primary source materials online. Do, do researchers need to register their interests with the government? Do they need to be that transparent or is it enough just to be open about the scholarship that they're doing? What do you think? And I think we'll probably mm -hmm. draw to a close after that. Yeah, well, no, I don't think there's, I don't think any country has a mechanism for that. Um, um, but um, uh, that doesn't mean that, it, you know, that is not, not a good idea. Um, if you're in a university setting, that's kind of handled for you in the sense that, you know, if you're doing a master's thesis, you will presume normally, you know, leave a paper trail, or, you know, there'll be documents saying that you're, you're doing your research on this topic. You'll have a you have a student card, set of blah blah blah. If you're more an independent researcher, you, know, you may have to find a way to to sort of signal the same thing in other in other ways. Um, so, um, um, but by and large, I'll say that it, no, it's not it's not. As dangerous as sometimes people think. Some people, I guess, sometimes get questions from just like you know, lay people. You know, isn't this super dangerous? You know, isn't aren't the intelligence services kind of don't they have a drone outside your house? Things like that. So no, I think for the most part, um, government monitoring of these of traffic to these sites, you know, you know, is so kind of sophisticated now that I think they can tell. <clears throat> um you know, false positives apart so um and 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 they are you know broadly speaking they you know they are after um the the kind of genuine bad guys uh and uh, and, and and uh not others so um so it's it's uh it's not uh it's not it's not a it's not it's not a complete minefield <laughs> but there you know there are things to bear in mind and there was yeah. of course ethical issues here uh you know you you should definitely not i think uh contribute actively to the forums you should not you, know, you should be especially if you and if you're coming to this from an academic standpoint you should strive towards passivity you know and just observe the, and also incidentally you know the moment you Act, you're active and write things, perhaps to gain access, stuff like that. Then you make your life, you can make your life more difficult vis-a-vis -vis precisely this kind of this, this you know, uh, communication with or deconflicting with authorities. Um, and if you are contributing, you are in fact a part of the phenomenon that you're supposedly just there to to observe, and you kind of you, you tinker with the your 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 uh, lab uh, product as you were you're 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 influencing um and distorting kind of the, the scientific process in some sense so you should yeah. avoid avoid that some some good basic methods in terms of you know the, drawing the line and, and making sure you're not uh influencing the thing that you're observing uh and and getting involved in by by 
by extent um, being implicated in, in whatever might be going on in, in the thing that you're observing. I, I think, you know, a lot of this, uh, just a closing comment from me, I won't ask any more questions, is that when we're talking about online, we're also getting into that world of, you know, digital open source intelligence, right? It was that commercial side or aspect of what, you know, academics might be doing and, and just calling research. Um, and of course, there, there's good practice in terms of taking some basic measures to preserve, you know, your personal security online um, without actually sort of, you know, disabling your own work by, by sort of putting too many obstacles in front of your ability to do that research online. Um, you can see different levels of sensitivity from different researchers in different sec sectors in terms of the tools they'll use to mask their identities or, or what have you. And I guess it's an open question in terms of academic research, how methods, but how much of that should be practiced on the academic side. But I, I don't have an answer to that. I don't, I don't have any uh, personal observations on that, but it's probably a good thing to think about if you're a researcher is how much, you know, how, how, how much value do you place on your own privacy regardless of who you think might be monitoring, but also when you're engaging with, you know, communities who may be in various kinds of sort of legal, legally questionable sort of circumstances that you need to be quite careful in terms of how you access, including opening up your browser and accessing a website because that will leave a trace that will influence your own profile. So those are things for, for researchers to consider. Thank you for the, for the comments in the chat. Thomas, we went a little bit over time, but this is really great. I, I hope it didn't turn into too much of a personal conversation between the two of us. Um, but I'm looking forward to, to picking it up at some point and, uh, and, and carrying on with this. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Thank, thanks, for, uh, thanks for contributing to this speaker series. And, uh, and uh, the, I'll give you the final word if you, if, you, if you have any more that you want to add. Thanks very much for having me, Marco. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'm going to just end the call entirely, and that will stop the video, I'm told. So thank you, and good night, everybody. Thomas, I'll be in touch. Probably on Twitter. Bye -bye.